in Gary's neighborhoods. Many of Gary's whites began to move to the suburbs, while blacks continued to move to Gary. It was becoming the blackest city in America. Frederick Tipton, a.k.a. Freddie Gibbs, would be born in Gary, Indiana in June of 1982. Though Freddie is from Gary, he does claim Chicago, Illinois as being his home as well due to Chicago being less than an hour away. Gary is perhaps most known for being the hometown of Michael Jackson and the Jackson family. Aside from this, Gary is also well known for housing one of the world's largest steel mills. But one of the unfortunate things that plagued the city is its violence. In 1994, when Freddie was around the age of 12, Gary was named the murder capital of the United States, according to the Chicago Tribune. At the time, Gary had roughly 119,000 people and they had a record of 120 killings in 1993, translating into a murder rate of 91 per 100,000 residents. This was well above the homicide rate in Washington, D.C. Prior to 1993, Washington, D.C. led the nation in the most recent years. Even looking somewhat recently in 2019, the violent crime rate in Gary was about 406, which was 85% higher than the U.S. national average of 220 that year. But this hectic environment is what Freddie Gibbs would grow up in. A lot of people in Gary work hard to try and get out. It's a depressed city, a depressed economy. It's still my home. I still live there. I got family, friends there. I feel like me putting this street music out, it's going to shed some light on the bad parts so maybe they can be fixed. Plus, it's no music scene in Gary. We don't even have our own radio station. Everything we got is up under Chicago. I gotta go and create the scene. Being the first dude to come out the city in the rap game is a lot of pressure. For one, people here in Gary, Indiana and think I'm some hick from the farm, but I'm from the bricks. This is the ghetto. This ain't no cornfield. Freddie grew up on the east side of Gary with a mother who worked at the post office and a father who was often between jobs. Many Freddie Gibb fans are well aware that his dad was once a police officer, but recently Freddie revealed that his father, Warren Tipton, is a member of the legendary R&B and soul group, The Shy Lights. There are some people who believe that he was a founding member, but this is not true due to him joining the group in 2018, which is nearly 50 years after their debut album. Warren has long been a musician and Freddie has also told stories of Michael Jackson and the Jackson 5 always beating his dad in talent shows around Gary, which is really hilarious. About his dad, Freddie would say, he was a singer and I guess he did what he had to do to support himself in the 80s when I was like 2 years old, he joined the police force. Anyway, it was some stuff, I don't know the specifics of it, but some scandal happened in 1991 that forced him to resign from the department. 
So throughout the years, he was always working super duper overtime or out of a job or looking for a job, just struggling for money. And I watched my mom struggle to take care of three kids, plus my little cousin and my dad. He knew a lot of the stuff that I was doing in the streets, but he didn't stop me from doing it. My dad was a cop, but he wasn't no angel. Know what I mean? A lot of cops in Gary ain't, especially now for one of the lowest salaries in the country. So you can imagine the corruption that goes on. Freddy would also elaborate on what it was like for him to go to school and see kids with fresh clothes, but he could not have the same due to the bills being tight around the house. This resulted in him taking it upon himself to be independent and get things that he desired. This would be the illegal way though, which has its fair share of consequences that eventually caught up with Freddy. While his father was a musician, Freddy never really desired to become one himself. Sports was more of his calling at the time, and it would be football that Freddy excelled in. There are reports that Freddy got a scholarship to play football at Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana, but in an interview, he said that he walked on. Nonetheless, Freddy was pretty aimless in this chapter of his life and still had one foot on the field and one foot in the streets. This would lead him to eventually getting kicked out and land back on the streets of Gary. Being back in this environment and living the lifestyle that Freddie was living led him to getting arrested multiple times. In an interview, he said that he caught a theft charge around the same time his first gun charge was still pending. His lawyer happened to know an army recruiter and told the judge about his connections. The judge then granted Freddie something that's known as pretrial diversion. This basically is an alternative to prosecution that's meant to circumvent the standard criminal justice process by entering a program that involves supervision and other services administered by the U.S. Probation Service. For Freddy, instead of being locked up, he would have to complete an army boot camp. So I went to the boot camp and it was one of the worst and most grueling experiences I ever went through, but I finished it near the top of the class. But that was not what I wanted for my life. No disrespect to anyone who does that for their career, but I didn't believe in all the stuff that the military was about, nor did I believe in what the administration was doing at the time. I did not want to be a part of that George Bush military, and so I did what I did, didn't take the army stuff seriously. I still was on my street stuff and whatnot, smoking weed, and got kicked out, dishonorable discharge. Now back again on the streets of Gary, Indiana, Freddie would have to do what it took to survive. However, things would change for him when he met a producer who goes by the name of Finger Roll. Freddie refers to Finger Roll as one of Gary's most successful producers at the time. He also says that he was one of the only people that had a studio in the area. Like I previously said, Freddie Gibbs did not have any intentions of doing music, but after feeling like he could make better music than the people that were in the studio, he decided to give it a try. Trying to make it out of Gary seemed hard enough, but to be a rapper and make it out of Gary proved to be even harder. There was no big rap scene, no rap radio stations, no record labels, etc. Freddie had to really get it out the mud, and it all started with his self-released first full-length project called Full Metal Jacket. My favorite song from this tape has to be Woo. From the beginning, you can definitely tell that Freddie had promise. Freddie, have you got your deal? Freddie, have you got your first check? Treat my business like a motherfucking alphabet. Like A, B, C, your way out. Cause I don't think you really want them shots to ring out. Uh. Freddie would follow this up with a sequel the same year. Things began to change for him when Ben Lambert, aka Lambo, would hear his early material. Lambo would be interning at Interscope Records at the time. His boss told him that if he could find a rapper to sign, then his internship could turn into a full-time job. With the pressure on, Lambo scoured the internet and heard a guy rapping over an Allen Iverson beat. Lambo was impressed by Freddie Gibbs, which led to him being flown out to California. For six months, Freddie would be between Los Angeles, New York, and Gary. He would be given a $50,000 advance, which he used to settle in LA to work on his debut album. His budget would be $250,000, which allowed him to work with producers such as Just Blaze and Polo to Don. 
While some people thought highly of his music, Freddie Gibbs would run into problems with label executives who doubted their ability to promote a rapper from Gary, Indiana. You also got to think that this is 2005, so Interscope was popping with 50 Cent and G-Unit from the East Coast. But Lambo would be interning for two men, and one of these men would go by the name of 3H. 3H would leave Interscope and in 2007, Freddie would be dropped from the label. However, Lambo did become Freddie's manager down the line. But once again, Freddie would have to return to Gary after California Dreaming. Now Freddie was back on the harsh streets of his hometown when his pregnant girlfriend at the time decided to move to Atlanta, Georgia. Freddie would go along in the hopes of there being a change in fortunes, but darkness continued to follow him. His girlfriend would have a miscarriage, his car got stolen, his grandmother passed away, and drugs really started to take a toll on him. He started popping Oxycontin for his headaches while sprinkling pills on his weed. From here, he was done with rapping and was just trying to hustle to start a business. This is when an old friend came calling, and this friend would be someone by the name of Josh the Goon. He was a producer and engineer that Freddie knew from his time in LA. Josh would constantly call Freddie, but Freddie did not pick up the phone. Finally, Freddie returned his calls and accepted a plane ticket back to LA where he would crash on couches for months while being uncertain of his future in rap. Big rest in peace to Josh the Goon, who passed away in 2017. Without him reaching out to Freddie, who knows how different Freddie's life could have been. Returning to LA must have been hard for Freddie though, due to how things with Interscope Records ended up, but now Freddie was reunited with Lambo, who tried to shop new deals for Freddie. All of this happened around 2008, and from 2005 to 2007, Freddie released multiple mixtapes consisting of the Big Business series, Gangsta Island series, Live from Gary, Indiana series, and This Is My Hustle. In early 2009, Freddie would release The Miseducation of Freddie Gibbs, which pays homage to Lauryn Hill's debut album. Later on in the year, Freddie Gibbs would release Midwest Gangsta Box Frame Cadillac Music, which is regarded as Freddie's breakthrough project. Box Frame Cadillac, in my opinion, is the hardest track on the project. In a four fifth in my lap, I'm in that box free Cadillac, swerving off the exit ramp. At the very end of 2009, Freddie would release The Labels Trying to Kill Me, The Best of Freddie Gibbs, which was a compilation of material that he recorded while he was on Interscope. Freddie's music started to gain buzz, but another thing he had to face was the direction of rap changing. The era of gangster rap was pretty much dead by 2010. Many people point to Kanye West beating 50 Cent in 2007 as being the end of this era. After this came the likes of your Drakes, Kid Cuddies, etc. Freddie did not make this type of music and record companies were focusing on acts that already had a big fan base. Sure, Freddie had a fan base, but it was really underground and wasn't quite as big as new acts that were coming out at the time. The notion going around of Freddie Gibbs was that if he never became a superstar, he could still have regional success. With the buzz Freddie already had, he kept grinding and grinding. This would finally get recognized in 2010 when Freddie landed a spot on the annual XXL freshman class cover. For those who don't know what this is, essentially XXL picks a number of artists that they predict will be the future. Freddie's class is absolutely stacked with the likes of J. Cole, Nipsey Hussle, Wiz Khalifa, Big Sean, J-Rock, and more. Freddie Gibbs was definitely in good company, and many people on this list would prove XXL in predicting that they would leave their mark in music. When talking about XXL, Freddie said that when you look at the cover, he's the rawest, dirtiest, uncut person on the cover. To give examples, he describes J. Cole as being a safe bet for labels. Freddie said that although Nipsey was a gangster, he had a look to him that you cannot deny. He also describes Wiz Khalifa as an all-American good kid with a smile that can light up the room. When speaking about himself, Freddie said that he was none of this and had to find his niche in the game. Even XXL labeled him as the most slept on out of the entire class. Most Hood went to J-Rock, Most Charismatic went to Wiz Khalifa, Most Well-Rounded went to J. Cole, and more. After the release of the XXL list, Freddie would drop both Straight Killer and Straight Killer No Filler in 2010. 
2011 would end up being a high output year for Freddy with him releasing seven projects. This consisted of a preview of a future project between Mad Lib and Freddy, the Straight Slamming trilogy, Effing with Fred, and Lord Giveth, Lord Taketh. My favorite project Freddy released this year is Cold Day in Hell though. My favorite track from this has to be Banned. But speaking of 2011, Freddy made a big move in his career, signing with CTE or Corporate Thugs Entertainment, which is Young Jeezy's record label. Freddy had this to say about the signing. I got a great respect for him and what he do, and the respect is mutual. Musically, I think we can bring this gangsta rap stuff back cause it's lacking. The first project Freddie released under the label would be Lord Giveth, Lord Taketh. The following year in 2012, Freddie dropped the mixtape Babyface Killer. Now this mixtape right here has a song that almost all of the viewers watching this know and that song is Still Living, which appeared on GTA 5. We definitely all blasted this song while on our way to a mission, but speaking of GTA 5, Freddy has multiple songs that appear on the soundtrack. This is actually how a lot of people found out who Freddy Gibbs was. And this is by no surprise because GTA 5 is one of the most popular video games of all time, so Freddy's music was being exposed to millions of people. But though Freddy would join CTE in 2011, he would be out the door by late 2012. It was a number of things at the end of the day. It was a good decision for myself and my family. It was nothing against him. It was just a move that I had to make personally and business wise. I'm going to tell you guys that honestly there are two sides to every single story and maybe even more. From my understanding after doing a lot of research it seems like Freddy just wanted to move on and turn his career in a different direction. On the flip side Jeezy wanted to go another way as well. Young Jeezy's side is that he questioned Freddy's work ethic. Allegedly Freddy Gibbs did not go to studio sessions. According to Jeezy, Freddy messed up his relationship with Eminem due to a track that they all did ending up leaking. There is some more to the story but these are some of the things that may have contributed to the split. After the fallout with CTE, Freddy would start his own label ESGN, this stands for Evil Seeds Grow Naturally. In 2013, Freddy released his debut album of the same name. This would be 9 years after his first project. After releasing his debut album, Freddy went on tour with perhaps one of if not the greatest and biggest underground artist of all time which is Tech 9 Freddie was a part of the independent grind tour in 2014. Touring around the country with an independent artist as big as Tech 9 helped Freddie build his own fan base. My dad took me to the Omaha stop of the independent grind tour where I saw Tech 9 and Freddie Gibbs perform. It was for my 13th birthday and Freddie impressed me. Of course I heard his music on GTA but this is when I finally put a face to the voice. A month before going on this tour, Freddie would release his collab project with Madlib called Pinata in March of 2014. This project was originally titled Cocaine Pinata and had been teased for a couple of years. Pinata is phenomenal from top to bottom. Madlib's production and Freddie rapping over it is the perfect combo, and I think that there's no better example of this than the track Thuggin'. How Madlib and Freddy came together to create Pinata was through a bizarre dream. Freddy revealed this in an interview with Hip Hop DX in 2013. As for how Freddy met Madlib, it would be through his manager Lambo. Lambo used to work for Stone's Throw Records, which Madlib was associated with. Madlib had heard Cold Day in Hell by Freddy, and Lambo told Madlib that he wanted Freddy to do something different over his style of beats. The two working together wasn't really planned out and they never recorded together. Freddy would listen to the beats that Madlib had and recorded vocals on his own. Freddy also describes him being in two different places when he recorded for this album. 
according to him he was still in the streets when he first started working on the album back in 2011. the full recording of the album lasted three years when asked if he was still in the streets when he was signed to young jeezy he would say that he was still in the streets he followed this up by saying that young jeezy never gave him any money but out of respect he didn't take any because he wanted to earn his now freddie seemed to be doing all right for himself after leaving the label and steadily building his fan base little did he know that not only his career but his life would take a dark turn soon in 2015 freddie dropped shadow of a doubt and a song that i really messed with off of this album is effing up the count it's one of my favorite songs from freddie another one of my favorite songs has to be cocaine parties in la which was released in 2016. Cocaine parties in LA. I'm juggling at some cocaine parties in LA. Yeah. Cocaine. The story behind this song is really interesting. Many people already know that Kanye and Kendrick rapped over the beat on Kanye's 2016 album, The Life of Pablo, for the song No More Parties in LA. Freddie Gibbs claims that he was given the beat first, but in reality, Mad Lib gave a bunch of beats to Kanye and Freddie. Kanye happened to release the song first, and after releasing it, Freddie would drop his version of it, which fans also loved. But 2016 would end up being one of the worst years in Freddie's life. While performing overseas in France, he would be arrested and accused of sexual abuse stemming from an incident alleged to have taken place in Austria 11 months earlier in July of 2015. It was alleged that after performing, Freddie Gibbs and his friends met two women backstage after the show and brought them to hang out in one of their rooms at his hotel. From here, the story is wild. The morning after the show, the women reported to police that an unnamed friend in Freddie's entourage had sexually abused them. Ten months later, in May of 2016, one of the girls told authorities that she remembered Freddie had sex with her the night of the incident and then additionally accused him of sexual abuse. The Austrian newspaper reported that Freddie and his friend allegedly took advantage of the two women after the drinks were possibly spiked backstage by someone at the show. After two weeks in jail, Freddie was bailed out for 50,000 euros, which back then was roughly $56,000. He was told that he could not go anywhere and his passport was confiscated. In July of 2016, Freddie voluntarily withdrew his appeal so he could be extradited to Austria to face trial. In August of that year, Freddie would be officially charged with sexual abuse of a defenseless or psychologically impaired person and face the maximum sentence of up to 10 years in prison. He was released from prison two days later after posting bail and paying another 50,000 euros, but he was again barred from leaving the country. In September of 2016, after being in jail for 37 days and having another 90 days stuck in two foreign countries in a four-hour trial, the Vienna Regional Court acquitted Freddie of all charges. The women essentially lied with video evidence, DNA evidence, witnesses, and more proving that Freddie was ultimately innocent. According to Freddie, one of the girls had a dream that she had sex with Freddie. This so-called dream that she had nearly sent Freddie away for a long time. People would think that growing up on the tough streets of Gary, Indiana would be one of the toughest situations that Freddie had to get out of, but when Freddie talked about his time in jail overseas, it's not good. Freddie Gibbs said that the guards would flash their flashlights at him while he was sleeping early in the morning and told him to rap. Guards even told him to rap in order to get food. They put him in cell blocks with people with swastikas and people who really did the crimes that he was accused of. Even after being found innocent, the case deeply affected Freddie to the point that he contemplated if he still wanted to do music. In his eyes, it was him being a rapper that got him into all of this mess. Months after being released, Freddie dropped You Only Live Twice and on this album, Freddie talks a lot about his situation overseas. Freddie talks about this on the track Crushed Glass.
After the release of You Only Live Twice, Freddie dropped an album titled Freddie and a collab project with rapper Currency and producer The Alchemist in 2018 called Fetty. 2019, in my opinion, is when Freddie really started to get his shine in the game when he teamed back up with Mad Lib for Bandana. In an interview with Billboard in 2019, it was revealed that Freddie wrote 80% of the album while he was locked up. He didn't have any way to play back the beats that Mad Lib gave him, so he had to go off of his memory. Mad Lib did not even think that him and Freddie would make another album, but once Freddie's charges were dropped, they completed Bandana ASAP. The big difference from Bandana and other projects that Freddie had was that Freddie was now with RCA Records. It was said that it made sense business-wise for Freddie Gibbs to now be with a major label and it did not take him much convincing. There were some fans who did not like this, but Freddie Gibbs said F them because he has kids to feed. However, this did not turn out to be a long deal because Freddie would ultimately leave the label for Warner Records in 2020. In 2021, Freddie Gibbs took to Twitter to talk about the situation, stating that after he made Bandana, the person that signed him to RCA ghosted him for a year plus. Before signing with Warner, Freddie and The Alchemist would drop a collab album of their own with Alfredo. This would be a long time coming because originally the two were supposed to drop a project together called The Devil's Palace in 2010, but that never happened. They did work with each other on Fetty, but this would be the first collab project between just them. Alfredo was made pretty quickly and unlike how Pinata was made, the two made the album together. It was as simple as Freddy picking beats that he liked and rapping over them. The intro track 1985 is one of my favorite tracks from the project. He's beating up Scotty in my crack lobby, y'all can smell the cane burning. Michael Jordan 1985, bitch, I travel with a cocaine sucker. Alfredo was released to widespread acclaim and the project ended up being nominated for Best Rap Album at the 2021 Grammy Awards. This might be slightly controversial, but I think Freddy should have won. Do not get me wrong, I think Nas getting a Grammy was long overdue, but ain't no way King's Disease was better than Alfredo. Like I said, that's just my opinion, but I think that Alfredo is a better album. I get why they gave it to Nas, but it is what it is. 2020 is also when the problems between Freddie Gibbs and DJ Academics started. The two first started feuding over the Gunna Crime Stopper situation, but it got way worse when Freddie Gibbs called Young Jeezy musically irrelevant. DJ Academics would respond questioning Freddie's own relevance. I remember when this happened and I believe by this time Freddie was banned from Instagram. If you were on Freddie's Instagram back in the day, he was posting the craziest but funniest stuff ever, I swear. But the two would go back and forth on social media and have problems with each other even to this day. Can't forget to mention that Freddie made an appearance on the Joe Rogan Experience in 2021 where he went viral for saying that he once shot a crackhead nine times with a Tech 9. <laughs> that clip is just bizarre. Uh, it's just crazy clip. As far as music that year, Freddie did not really release much, but the next year in 2022, his most successful and recent album, Soul Soul Separately, would release. The album peaked at number 11 on the Billboard 200 charts. This is a concept album based around a fictional resort and casino. The album's title comes from a line in a song called Education that was on Bandana. After this album though, things would go downhill for Freddie, mainly due to two events. One of them is Freddie's issues with Benny the Butcher. The two were once friendly, but things would get sour when Freddie tweeted out some stuff that many people said was aimed at Benny the Butcher. It should be noted that at this time, Benny the Butcher recently got shot in the leg during an attempted robbery in 2020. There were talks of Benny and Freddie releasing a collab album together, which I'm sure would have been great, but these talks stalled. These problems would eventually lead to Freddie Gibbs getting beat up while he was in Buffalo, New York, which is Benny's hometown. Freddie Gibbs was in town to perform, and I will say, despite the damage that was done to him, he still performed that night. People respected him for this, but his image still took a hit. 
perhaps the biggest thing that happened to him which made him look crazy was his relationship with adult star Fit Mommy. From the jump, people questioned their relationship and why Freddy was messing with her, but things would go all the way left when Fit Mommy said that she was pregnant and basically Freddy ghosted her. This is when academics comes back into the fold even though after their problem started, he never truly went away. The Fit Mommy Spready Gibbs incident is when DJ Academics turned the beef up to a thousand and would not let Freddy off of the hook. He went as far as to call Fit Mommy on stream where she would further expose Freddy. This was a terrible look for him and also for her. It's really crazy how Freddy had worked for years to be in the position that he was in in 2021 to have things go sour not that long after. The one thing that Freddy does need to do is take accountability for his faults in the situations between Phil Mommy, Academics, and Benny. In the future, I hope that he just focuses on the music and not get wrapped up in the negativity. While in recent years, Freddy's reputation and image have taken damage, I don't think that that should fully take away from everything that Freddy had to do to get on. Being a black man from Gary, Indiana, trying to make it in the music business, selling drugs to get by, then going to college to play football, but fumbling that opportunity. Catch a case, then instead of going to prison, you go to military boot camp get dishonorably discharged and return back home where you get the opportunity to sign to Interscope Records. That deal goes sour, so now you're back on the streets again. Now you're thinking about quitting due to all of these unfortunate events happening in your life and you get a phone call which saves your career. You slowly start building up a buzz and right when you're about to take off, you get falsely accused of crimes that you never committed in another country. Now you're facing 10 years being locked up, but before this, you're getting treated very poorly. You finally beat this and consider quitting music again, but you persevere once again and finally start getting the recognition that you deserve. This is what Freddy had to go through, and many people who were exposed to Freddy these past couple of years don't know this. It's unfortunate that the Fit Mommy, Academics, and Benny the Butcher situation left a bad impression on people of Freddy. Like I said, he has faults in all of these situations. When it comes to music, I think that Freddy is a phenomenal artist, but I do think that he should just focus on that and his other endeavors, such as acting, for example. Don't get me wrong, I think that he's a hilarious guy and became more of a fan when he had his old Instagram, but when he started doing all of this beefing and stuff, I wasn't really liking all of that. But let me know in the comments what you think of Freddie Gibbs and his career. After everything, do you still mess with him? Why or why not? All in all, let me know what you thought of the video. I love you guys with all my heart. Peace.